We, uh, we love to um, tell Amanda's story and keep you all updated on the work that God's doing in Rwanda and the work that God's doing through her and Hope for Life Ministries. As, as she talked about, she grew up um, in Chapel Street and four years ago was called to Rwanda. And so um, initially, uh, when we started to hear about the work that was taking place there, and Amanda was sharing some of the stories, Serve the World, which is our um, it's a generosity initiative where you all uh, give um, and we s- take that money and we send it to places where we see the gospel being tangibly made known through local and global partners. And um, Hope for Life Ministries is one of those partners that we have been supporting and that you all have given so generously to. And um, I don't want to give it all away, but, but this December we're going to have the opportunity to come alongside of Hope for Life again as a church. And, um, and just to kind of give you sort of a, a precursor to what's coming, we have another video in, in two weeks. And when Manda first approached us about six months ago with this vision that God had um, for Rwanda and for Hope for Life, and talking about the opportunity to build a second um, boys home um, for the street kids, um, there was just something inside of us that said, we, we want to be a part of this. We want to support this. And so Amanda's going to share more about this story, and you're going to have the opportunity, and we will have the opportunity as a church to help see that realized this December. Um, so be paying attention to that. We, we look forward to um, sharing more of this story and maybe be praying even now about the part that you might play in, in seeing that vision realized. We're excited for the work God is doing there and excited for all of the impact that, that you have helped realize through Serve the World. Um, your generosity is continues to humble us and uh, encourage us. And there's uh, so much more that, that we believe God wants to do. Um, and this week, we are kicking off our celebration of Advent together. So let me ask you a question. What is your personal favorite part about Christmas? Like, what is it that, that you love the most about it? Like some of you are, are those uh, decoration people, right? Like you, you love all the lights and the Christmas trees and your house is just like uh, covered in red and green. Like doesn't this place look great? Like didn't they do a fabulous job with this? Like the stars up there? I know, it's like, I love that sort of thing. Like I get into it, like my, my family, I like decorating at home and, um, and, and it seems to like get earlier and earlier every year. Like I think we're precariously going to be one of those, like you become those people on the block, right? Where it's like basically October to February is, is your window. Um, and some of you love the food around Christmas. I love the food around Christmas. Just yesterday, cookies were being baked in my home. I had nothing to do with it other than the eating part. And it was fabulous. Like, I, I just, there's something about it. It's like nostalgic for me. It brings back all of the memories. Um, some of you love gift giving. Like, you just, you're, you're good at it. You, you know the people that you care about, and you go out and you find the perfect thing, and, and, and you give it to them. It's like a love language for you. And some of you love gift getting. Like, that's my ability. Like, I'm uniquely equipped and wired for that. Some of us, is just family time, right? Kids are home from college, and, and you see people that you don't normally see, and you're surrounded, and you're together, and you just love all of that. Maybe it's the music and the worship, and, and you tune into that, and it's, it, it takes you back to a, a time in life, and, and you love the celebration part of it. Some of you, it is the, the deep and complicated plots of a Hallmark Christmas movie, right? Or you're just trying to figure out how is this going to end? <laughs> For me, I think if I were to narrow it down to kind of one thing, I would say part of what I love about this time of year is, is the tradition. I love that as a family, we've created habits and patterns that, that guide our, our celebration of Christmas. For instance, one of our traditions as a family is we, we almost every December take our, our three daughters down and we go down into the city and we go to Michigan Avenue and we, we, we see all the lights and we have dinner together and we go shopping. And my, my daughters, when they were little, always loved to go to the American Girl doll store and to see the windows and to dream about what doll they wanted. And I always tried to explain to them that the clothes that they sold for the dolls were more expensive than the clothes that we bought for them. Um, and that did not stop their dreams from, from running wild. And there's something about that. Every, every year when we do that, when we have that, 
that day. Sometimes we stay down there. We'll do like a night in a hotel. And there's always something inside of me that's like Christmas is almost here. Like it's that, that sense of anticipation, that sense of excitement that wells up in me when we have that trip. And I, I love it. And it's part of the reason that I love this time of year together in the church is the way we celebrate Advent together as Chapel Street. And the church, early in its history, determined that it would be important for us to have established patterns, traditions in many ways, to remind us again the significance of what God was going to accomplish by taking on flesh, what, what he would ultimately do as he entered into the chaos and the brokenness of humanity by sending Emmanuel, God, with us in order to bring redemption and restoration. See, it's, it's, it's the tradition that, that helps us, helps give meaning to the celebration. It's, it's, it's intended to remind us that for generations, the people of Israel lived in this perpetual sense of expectation and anticipation. To help us feel again that, that longing for God's future provision. And then to be reminded of all the, the wonder and the majesty that is, that is equally um, demonstrated in humility and grace as Jesus arrives. And, and as one of us. To be the very provision of the long expected Savior. Israel's Messiah and the hope of the world. Advent is an intentional set-apart season in the life of the church to remember, to feel our need, and, and to celebrate God's answer. So my, my prayer for us over these next few weeks is that, that all of this rich tradition, whether it's at home or with your family or here together collectively, that it would once again give meaning to our celebration. That it would point us back to the incredible gift of, of God himself taking on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ to be our Savior and our King. In order, us, in order for us to, to re-enter this sense of longing for a future hope. Over the next few weeks, we're going to focus on one of the prophecies in, in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, that, that describes and names Israel's coming king, their coming Messiah, their hope. So let's turn there to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to look at verse 6 through, uh, well, verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. See, in these verses here, Isaiah poetically and beautifully depicts the, the coming Messiah, the one who is going to be our wonderful counselor, our, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The, these words of Isaiah here, they're both full of hope, but they, they also carry this weight, this power behind it. And as we look at this prophecy, I want us to begin by looking that it's spoken into the midst of a desperate need. A desperate need. That's our first point for this morning. I think about the power of Isaiah's words here, his prophecy. I think it's most profoundly understood when it's seen in the context of what else Isaiah has been speaking to the people of Israel. You know, you know how we more keenly feel and understand good news when, when it's received in the midst of of desperation or of need. For example, when I, with the very first day that I had started working at Chapel Street Church, this was 12 years ago, uh, my wife and I, we lived in Wheaton at the time, and so before we were able to move out to Batavia, we would, I would commute out and drive out every morning, and I just drove this, this old Pontiac Grand Am. It was a, a, a total beater, and, um, and on the very first day, it had all kinds of mechanical problems like it was held together with prayer and duct tape primarily and 
and my car died like on my first morning driving out and it would it would stall out occasionally it did that but I, I couldn't get it started again and so I called Pastor Bruce and I said hey I'm, I'm I'm stuck out here can you come get me and take me to work like that's not great when you have to call your boss on the first day and have him pick you up on the side of the road but he did that, and, and so my mind is swirling at this point because I'm assuming like this is the, the last straw for this car. Like I knew it was worth nothing, so repairing it really was, if it was going to be any kind of significant issue, was not going to be worth it. And I also knew simultaneously I had no money to, to buy another car. And so I'm just kind of got like that pit in your stomach feeling all day, like what are we going to do, how are we going to get replace this sort of thing. And so Bruce, who, who knew Willie Padilla, he goes to Chapel Street, he's probably fixed some of your cars, and called him up and said, hey, when, when we're at work today, can you have a look at Sterling's car? And, and so later that afternoon, uh, my phone rang, and I knew exactly who it was and what was coming. Like, this was the, this was the, the, the proclamation, right? Willie's going to say it's dead, there's no hope for it, like, all that sort of stuff. And um, I answer the phone, uh, prepared to hear that, and Willie says, hey, here's what's going on. There's a sensor in your exhaust system. It's, it's faulty. He said, there's two things I can do. I can, I can um, take it out and replace it and repair it and put it in, and here's what that's going to cost. And he said, or I can just disconnect it. And I said, you'll, you'll get a little less um, gas mileage, but your car won't stall out anymore. I was like, what? Like, this was like the greatest news I had ever received, right? Like you just like unadulterated worship. Like that was like the, the most fantastic thing because I'm, I'm anticipating financial crisis and Willie says, I just got to unplug something. And we, we feel it's like the, the, the situation maybe you've experienced before, like you go to the doctor, maybe anticipating bad news or something like that. There's this need, this desperation when a doctor looks at you and says, hey, I've got, I've got great news. Like you feel that more acutely, more keenly. When, when good news arrives in the midst of our, our desperation. See, this is Isaiah's, this is the climate that he's speaking into. If you turn back to Isaiah chapter 1, I just want you to get a picture of what Isaiah has spoken to the people of Israel prior to this time. I'm going to begin in verse 10. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instructions of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The, your, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and of the fat, the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. And when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. Then jump down to verse 15. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. See, Isaiah is, is delivering God's message to the people of, of Judah. The, Israel and Judah are, are separate at this point. I'm kind of using those terms to mean the same thing this morning, but and the news is not good. To, to, when Isaiah calls them the rulers of Sodom and the people of Gomorrah, that's not a compliment. This is, this is, these were the recipients of God's judgment as a result of, of sin. And Isaiah is making this rather clear connection between the spiritual condition that led to their judgment and the condition that the people of God are in, in the midst of, of their relationship with him. And Isaiah speaks this through his prophecy, he describes a people who are, are far from God, where the relationship is, is distant or non-existent, when the people are sort of merely going through the motions. You get the picture. So they are, they're bringing their sacrifices. They're burning incense, but... But when they leave the temple, they're worshiping at the feet of a false idol, and they, they're oppressing those who don't have the ability and the power to defend themselves, and they're living as if God didn't exist. So God, in, in no uncertain terms, says, stop the charade. Stop, stop pretending. I don't want your meaningless sacrifice. 
I don't want you, I don't want you trampling the courts of my temple, and I don't want to listen to your insincere prayers while your hearts remain far from me. Like Isaiah is not holding anything back here. The people of Israel offered sacrifices as an indication of their repentance, but what Isaiah is saying is the external expression isn't matching their, their internal reality. There, there's sacrifice, but there's no repentance. And, and he says to God, it's unacceptable. Like literally, like he will not accept it. And to make matters worse, Israel is, is surrounded by the Assyrian Empire. They're living under the imminent threat of, of their invasion. So what I want us to understand is that Isaiah is speaking this prophecy to a people in crisis, spiritual, national, and in every way crisis. It's a crisis of their own making, but a crisis nonetheless. And God ultimately will allow the people of Israel to experience their judgment as a result of their sin. But he will not abandon them there. He doesn't leave them in that place. See, I think it's, it's, it's vital when we look at Isaiah chapter 9 to understand it in the context of what he said up to this point. Because in order for us to fully understand the nature of the victory that God is ultimately going to secure, we first have to understand and grasp the desperate condition of, of our need. Yes, I mean, Isaiah is speaking specifically to a, a, the people of Israel. He's speaking into a historical context here. But in doing so, again, we are reminded we're allowed to see once more the ramifications of sin, what, what that does in, in us. So it's, it's instructive for us as well. As we understand our own spiritual condition, our own hearts prior to being delivered by our Savior. Like you, you know that feeling, right, when you, you get a gift that you don't really need? Like when, you, when somebody gives you something, maybe it's at work or wherever else, and you open it up, and it's something you already have or something that you don't really need. Like I, I Google just out of curiosity, what are the most common re-gifted gifts? Like word to the wise, don't get anybody a candle this year. Because we just apparently are passing those around between each other. Because they, like, our, our, our sense, what that evokes in us when we get something that we, maybe we don't really need it, is, is I, I don't know, disappointment maybe, but dis, we're disillusioned. We kind of just dismiss it, right? But when, and here's the difference, when, when Isaiah writes this, when he starts to talk about this, this, uh, the child who would be born, the Savior who'd be given, he's speaking into the midst of a desperate need. We only rightly understand the nature of the gift if we first understand the spiritual condition apart from Jesus. And so we have to begin at the point of the need. And my encouragement for us as the church right now is, is I, I love all the fanfare and the joy of Advent. And we need to arrive there. And yet part of this season, part of the design and intention behind it is to allow us to remember again the desperate need, our desperate condition apart from Christ. Because it informs and instructs and helps us understand the, the impact of the gift that he gives. And so Isaiah is speaking this into this desperate crisis situation. And in the midst of that, he says, but I have good news. I have good news, people of Israel. I have good news, Judah. God's going to do something about this. He's going to make provision for your greatest need, and it's not going to come through a military victory. The, the Assyrians eventually do come in and send the people into exile, but it's going to come through the gift of a son. The gift of a son. I, uh, um, and we all know this, like we live in a digital world now, and so a lot of our shopping takes place over the internet. It's online, and and if you're looking forward to something getting like that, as you know, I had a birthday last month, and so I got a few gift cards and different things. And so just last week, I, I went online to do a little shopping, and I got myself uh, some new tools, which I'm really excited about, and all these things, because I, I love that kind of stuff. And all week long, I would go on and sort of check the status of it, right? I would go on and it would see like order pending, which like that's the, that's the first level. And then it would say shipping 
pending, right? And then delivery pending. And now Amazon's just like creepy where it's like eight houses away from this. Like <laughs> literally when I'm, I'm, I'm writing my sermon, I, I, I was checking to see how close these items were to, to getting to my house. Um, and this is, this is what Isaiah is saying to the people of Israel here. You have a desperate need, but there is a Savior pending. There is a Savior coming. Look back at at Isaiah chapter 9. What what he writes prior to this prophecy in verse 1, he says, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing up the plunder. See, here's in in, in the book of Isaiah, in in these chapters, there's this, this powerful juxtaposition that is taking place. Throughout these chapters, God is absolutely clear. He promises that he will bring judgment as a result of of sin and rebellion amongst the people. But right alongside of that, right next to it, consistently, simultaneously, he offers the promise of restoration. In fact, we hear it in these verses. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, judgment. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nation's restoration. In verse 2, people walking in darkness, isolation and confusion, judgment, have seen a great light. Hope, restoration. You see, throughout this book, for nearly every proclamation of judgment, Isaiah speaks a promise of hope. And Isaiah describes this promise into us by in in verse 6 saying, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. There's two things here that stand out to me. First, this whole passage, everything that Isaiah speaks here, it's it's about God delivering. It's God promising to bring light and hope and help and peace to those who desperately need it. And what strikes me as I read all of this is how incredibly relevant it remains. Isaiah wrote these words some 2,800 years ago, and yet the promise of light in the midst of darkness, of hope in the midst of of hopelessness, of peace in the midst of chaos and heartache, it speaks directly into the needs and the fear that we experience in our own cultural climate. In fact, it remains true for every generation. As As a pastor, and I think really more so just as a human being, you, I look around and I, I see and evaluate our issues in society, what's going on in our world, and you, you strategize and you dream and you think about ways to, to resolve these things and to, to sort of push back. And at times, honestly, it becomes, it's overwhelming. It can be even discouraging, hopeless. And yet, When we read Isaiah, we we, we are reminded once again that the answer remains the same today as it was then. And at the risk of sounding cliche, that, that awareness arriving at the fact that Jesus is the answer. He is God's provision, his direct solution to the confusion and to the the hopelessness that is a life apart from him. The, the Apostle John, when he begins to describe in his gospel the, the arrival of Messiah, he echoes Isaiah's terms there. In fact, turn to John chapter 1, the very beginning of his book. This is how he describes the arrival of, of God in flesh. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You hear hear John echoing the promise that Isaiah spoke of 700 years prior to this. 
And it was true when Isaiah spoke it. It was true when John wrote it, and it remains true now. And additionally, in, in, in verse 6, we, we also discover that this child that is, is going to be born is not just merely a child who is born, but this is a son that is given. See, describe this child that would rule and reign and to, be, to be given is, is to acknowledge again that, that this is a will, this is an act of the will of God. This is God moving intentionally on our behalf. It's his choice to meet the needs of his people. Knowing full well what it's going to cost him. It's, it's, it's God's generosity to us on display. And I think it's important that we don't overlook this because this isn't, this isn't obligation. This isn't duty. This isn't giving somebody a gift because they got something for you. This is a willing act of a God who loves us. Who understands the nature of our greatest need and who has made a way to meet that need. This is God giving of himself. Taking on human flesh as a child. And then thirdly, we see that this gift is named. This gift is, is named. I don't know if you've ever like opened something up and not known what it is. Have you ever had that moment? Like my, my, my grandma um, used to love to get very practical gifts for the family. And specifically like all the women in the family. So there would be, she, she was like a product of the depression and so practicality was just something that was ingrained in her and so every year whatever she discovered if it was like a new kitchen knife that she just loved everyone got one and so my wife opened up this this package and it was like a green cloth like you kind of thought like she's finally lost it you know like she's and and she began to explain to us how she discovered like this this green cloth and how it's meant for drying lettuce and you put your lettuce, it's like a little terry cloth thing, you put your lettuce in there and you pat it dry and then you can make a salad and all this sort of stuff. Like, okay, thank you, Grandma, you know, like, it's wonderful. And, and what's funny is that, like, that was probably 10 years ago, my, every salad we've ever had since that time, that lettuce has been dried by this cloth, right? Because we understand what it is. So this is, this is Isaiah's purpose here. When he begins to name and describe this child, he wants you to understand more intuitively the nature of the gift that's being given. He wants you to understand what it is that God is doing here. Again, back in verse 6 and 7, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. See, each, each of the names, each of the titles reveals something to us about the nature and the character of Christ. And this really is going to be our focus over, over the next couple of weeks, beginning with just this the idea of him being our wonderful counselor. Isaiah, in these, these verses, he talks a lot about government and rule and reign, and, and he uses these titles as he's uh, describing the promise that would arrive in these, these, these kingly and, and royal terms. Jesus is, is the Messiah who is royal and who is kingly. He is our wonderful counselor. And again, remember the context that he's speaking this into. Isaiah is describing Jesus as the coming king by contrasting him to, to what the people have already known to their current king, Ahaz, who's, who's led them to a place of destruction as a result of leading them away from God, or the worship of God. And so he's contrasting this Ahaz, and he describes Jesus in contrast to that as the one who is our, our wonderful counselor. That term there, wonderful, it, it, it's the Hebrew word pile. And it, it, it means more than just sort of um, impressive or incredible. It really means uh, miraculous, awe-inspiring. So it, it's talking about the sort of thing that only God can do. And our counselor is, is, is a royal kingly term. It's one who, who advises, a legal advisor 
to, to the King, the Messiah, Savior, Jesus, is the one whose wisdom is divine. So much so that when we experience it, when we discover it, it, it fills us with awe and wonder. The Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians, he captures the same notion that Isaiah is, is showing us, demonstrating to us when he talks about our wonderful counselor. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to this. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. See, Jesus, he's saying Jesus is our wonderful counselor. He is the wisdom of God in flesh. And it's not merely a, a, a wisdom, it's not good advice in the midst of our circumstances. When he talks about him being our, our wonderful counselor, the wisdom of God is, is the good news of the gospel itself. It's the wisdom that leads us to repentance and restores us in relationship to the Father. His, his wisdom is life, and his counsel is to show us the love of the Father by revealing to us the good news of his kingdom. Jesus is the child promised by God, the son who was given. He's the wonderful counselor through whose salvation itself is known and received. And so as we conclude this morning, I want to invite the worship team to to return, and we are going to um, respond this morning by receiving communion. And I've always, um, as a pastor, and again, just as a worshiper, loved um, and felt it was so appropriate to celebrate communion in the midst of Advent. Because really it's, it's communion that is the realization that was given to help us remind us of the extent of his love for us and how it would be realized and demonstrated. And so as we conclude this morning, our ushers will come and they will pass out the communion elements. You'll have two cups stacked together. You can grab both of those and hold on to those. And then I will return in just a moment and I will guide us in the receiving of the elements together. And so would you pray with me? Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for this season. We thank you that we have the opportunity to gather together in community and to be reminded once again that in the midst of our greatest need, you would speak life and hope and peace, and you would do so by the giving of your Son, the one who is our wonderful counselor. So Lord, remind us again, afresh, anew. Allow us to sense that, that anticipation, that expectation of your provision. And as we receive this morning the elements of your table, let us see and be reminded of how you realize that. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.